Welcome to our last video, video 7 of chapter 1, where we are finishing up finally with our third part of displaying quantitative data graphically. In the past two videos, we've talked about histograms, we've talked about dot plots, we've talked about stem plots, and we are going to end with one more plot, and that is the box plot. Now, you might have heard of this, or maybe seen this uh, years ago, known as the box and whisker plot, but we are just going to refer to it as a simple box plot. All just one word, all stuck together here, box plot. Okay? Now, box plots look like these, and these are multiple box plots. Now, really, we're going to examine one box plot at a time, but there are scenarios where maybe you look at maybe two box plots at a time so that you can easily compare their distributions, right? You could easily compare their socks to each other. But we need to talk about the features of a box plot. What do all these lines mean in here? So one thing I just also want to say is uh, these are vertical, uh, stretched out vertically here, but typically box plots are going to look more like this, especially in your calculator. They're going to be more horizontally stretched out with an axis, and the axis isn't going to be up here, so let me flip it the other way around. And typically your box plots will look like this. And again, if we focus just on one particular box plot at a time, uh, it would look like this. You'd have an axis which, though, sorry, uh, this would be inverted the other way, where 0 starts here and 12 goes down here, uh, and th then it would stretch out accordingly. So let's talk about how do you actually get that box plot? How do you make one? So there's a thing called the five-number summary. All right, so if you're ever told the five-number summary is, it is referring to the following five values. And the first number of the five-number summary is the minimum value. The second is the first quartile, or Q1. Uh, we used this earlier to calculate IQR so that we could calculate outliers. Uh, but besides Q1 and the first quartile, it might be referred to the lower quartile. The third number is the median. The fourth number is Q3, or the third quartile, or may be referred to as the upper quartile. And the fifth number is the maximum value. Now, if those five numbers aren't given to you, but you're given a set of data, then you just need to do what we've done in the past and put all your data in a list, and then go to Stat, over to Calc, do one variable statistics, scroll down to the bottom, and the last five numbers are the five number summary values. So using those five numbers, here's how we're going to make our box plot. So if I knew where the minimum was, and once I've labeled my axis uh, with whatever values that I need to use here, and I'll do a ex specific example next, but whatever my numbers are here, uh, let's say my minimum was located here, so I might first start with a little point, a little dot, and then I'm going to go find where's Q1 at on my axis, where's the median at on my axis, let's say it's right here, where's Q3 at on my axis, and I might put a little point right here, so I'm trying to line these up. And then I go down, I'm like, well, here's approximately my maximum point, and then here's how you do it next. So once you have those five values kind of marked, and you make them kind of horizontal to each other. You could go vertical if your axis was vertical. But then between Q1 and Q3, you're going to make this box. And really that box, the width of that box, represents the IQR, the interquartile range. That's the difference of Q1 and Q3. Then where the median's located, you're going to draw a line through it. And will the median always be right in the middle of this box? No, not necessarily. And then from Q1 to the min, you're just going to draw, this is what we used to call our whisker in a box and whisker plot. You just draw this line, stretch it out to the minimum, and sometimes they'll put like a little line like this so you know that that for sure is the minimum. And then down here at the maximum, you just connect Q3 up to that maximum, and if you want, you could put a little kind of vertical line on that. Now again, all the way from the minimum to the maximum, there's our range. So we can see the range graphically in our box plot, but we can also see the IQR in our box plot as well. And we know the location of the median is the line in the box plot. Now, one thing that will seem kind of weird here, maybe, is that box plots really don't have a second axis. So if I were labeling all my numbers down here horizontally, there really is nothing vertically to discuss. 
All right? Or if you were making a, a vertical box plot, there would be no horizontal axis. So let's take a look at an example here. So I have Barry Bonds' home run data from 1986 to 2007. And this is his actual home run values here. Uh, and what I did was I put all these into a list, like list one, uh, and then went to stat, over to calc, and I did some one variable statistics. And I scrolled down to the bottom, and here are my five values. Here's my five number summary. And let me just tell you, I've done the math already. So just kind of take my word for it on this time around, but there are no outliers present. And you might wonder, well, what does it really matter if there are outliers present? Because box plots can show outliers in a special way. Okay? So this is just going to be a plain old looking box plot. Now, I decided to start number of home runs at five and really have my spacing, my intervals here by five home runs. Uh, or I really just numbered them specifically by 10s starting at 5 all the way up to 75. You could start at 0 if you really want to. You don't have to. And if your data set was nothing but numbers in the hundreds, I wouldn't start at 0. I would start at a nice number on the minimum side, like maybe 100 if all the numbers were triple digits. All right. So now I'm going to take my minimum of 5, and I'm going to put a little dot right here for now. Q1 is 25, so here's 25. Now maybe you can see why I started at 5 and counted by 5s. Uh, median's 34, so here's 35. I'll go a smidge below that, put a little point. Q3 is 45, so perfectly right here, put a little dot there. And the max is 73, so here's 70, here's 75. Uh, we'll say right here, roughly is 73. So some numbers you're going to have to roughly estimate where they go. Now, here was Q1, here was Q3. Again, I'm going to make my box. Does it matter how tall this box is? Not really. Just make a nice rectangular box. And then where the median was, that's where the line goes in the box. And then stretch out Q3 up to the max. And you can leave it just like that, or you could kind of put that little marking on there. And then again, Q1 down to the minimum. And you can put that little marking there if you like. So now I see Barry Bonds' home run data in a box plot graphically. So this is still the same type of thing I just showed you earlier here. But now I want to show you an example of a data set where there is an outlier and how that's going to change things just slightly. So I got a fictitious character here, Jimmy Juicer. He likes the juice, a.k.a. steroids. Uh, and here's his home run data from 86 to 2004. And so again, I put this data... Uh, you could put it into list one and write over Barry Bonds' data, or you could put it into list two. It really doesn't matter. But I did some more one-variable statistics, and I came up with the five-number summary here. Now, suppose I did my 1.5 IQR rule check for outliers, and I found out that 80 is an outlier. So keep that in mind. I, have, I already know that 80 is an outlier. I'm not going to redo all the math to prove that, but 80 is an outlier. All right, so now let's start with the box plot. And notice I did the same axis as I did on Barry Bonds. It might be different for a different player. doesn't matter. So the minimum's 5. So I'll come up here, 5. Q1's 18. So here's 20. So maybe 18's like right here. Uh, median's 26, so just a smidge above 25. Uh, Q3 is 37. So we'll say 37's right here. And the max is 80, which would be all the way out here. Now, regardless if you have outliers or not, we're going to go ahead and connect together our Q1 and Q3 box. And I'm going to go ahead and draw in my median line. Now, 5 was not considered an outlier, so I can go ahead and connect Q1 to my minimum. But since 80 is an outlier, I'm not going to connect Q3 to this outlier. The outlier is going to kind of just be floating around out here by itself. And what you could do is you could use your own unique symbol, like you could do a little asterisk uh, or a star or a plus sign. You just need some value or some symbol out here that represents an outlier. So the calculators will oftentimes use like a, um, a hollow square, or you could do a plus sign, or simply just a dot could represent an outlier. You're just not going to have anything connected to this outlier. And if I had more than one outlier, then I would just have multiple dots. Like, let's say, for instance, 75 is an outlier. So, boom, hey, look, I got 75 now. And I would put just another dot here, and I don't connect the dots at all. 
So now the question is, well, if I don't connect Q3 to this outlier, what do I connect Q3 to? So now I have to go back and look at my data, and I need to find what was the biggest number in this data set that was not the outlier of 80. And so if I scan through here, I think, if I'm looking right here, 50 is the biggest number that wasn't considered an outlier. So I would go to 50, put a point here, and that's what I connect Q3 to. And then the 80 is just kind of floating around out here. So here's where the bulk of my data is, but I also have this outlier at 80 down there. Okay, so sometimes you have an outlier. Uh, and outliers can be, there can be more than one. There could be some outliers down here on the lower end and on the upper end. Okay, but you don't connect anything to them. And one other slight little thing that might pop up. Uh, what if I had two 80s? What if two years he hit 80 home runs? Then I would just put kind of maybe two dots and kind of stack them on top of each other. All right, so that I would know that there were two outliers of 80, if that happens. Now, how do you do this in your TI-83 or 84? Well, hopefully you already have the data in a list. So you'd have your data in a list, doesn't matter which list. Go to second Y equals up there in the top left-hand corner to get to your stat plot. This is where we got to the histogram uh, in video six. And we need to turn on one of our plots. And maybe you already have a plot on from the last video with histograms. So just make sure one of your plots is currently on. And instead of the histogram, you want to select this box plot option, the one that has the two little dots at the end. Now notice there is another box plot right next to it, uh, but it does not show outliers. Why wouldn't it show outliers? I don't really know, but we're never going to select this one that doesn't have those two little dots here. Always select the box plot that shows outliers. And then tell your calculator what list your data was in. Maybe it's list one, maybe it's list two. Uh, and frequency, just leave as a one. We just want one of those lists. Now, the mark down here, this is what I was referring to earlier. These are the markings that would illustrate outliers. And by default, it does that little hollow square. You could change it to a plus sign. You could change it to a little dot if you like. I kind of like these first two options just because they're bigger and they're more noticeable whenever you graph them. Once you got that, you can go zoom nine, go zoom or go down to nine if you want to get to select zoom stat. And then there is my Jimmy Juicer uh, box plot. And notice there is that outlier down here at 80. Now, some other things that I want to show you with the calculator is if you were to press the trace button, the trace button is located in the top up by the graph button. Uh, it should start you down here, and it'll say the minimum is 5. Okay, just so you know that specific number there. And then if you press the right keypad, right arrow keypad, it'll go down to the next part of the box plot, and it tells us here that Q1 is 18. Awesome, thank you. Press the right arrow button again. goes down to the median there in the middle. It's got a value of 26. Go down again, Q3 is 37. Go down again, and here's, it'll just say X equals 50, because this isn't truly the maximum value in our data set. So it knows that it has a special value to it, but notice it doesn't call it the max, because it's really not the max. And then go over once more, and it'll show us that outlier, which is the max, but notice it doesn't say outlier, just that symbol down here means that that is an outlier. So you could, um, let's say, I don't know, uh, you didn't have the data set, or it was secret or something, you could see what the five number summary is uh, by using the trace function, or you could use it just to verify it. So there's the min, there's the Q1, there's the median, there's Q3, and then technically here's the max of 80, but it ended up being an outlier. So 50 ended up kind of being our quote-unquote max that really wasn't an outlier. So what I want you guys to do now is I've given you a data set of 20 numbers of SAT scores, and I would like you to create a box plot in your calculator and then copy it down in your notes, and then you can even make your own axis, uh, start with a particular value, um, I mean, it would really make no sense to start at zero since our numbers are all uh, four-digit numbers. 
I think our smallest value here is this 1020. So maybe a nice beginning number for your axis would be a thousand. Um, and then a maximum, what do we got here? 1500. I don't know, maybe stop at 1500. And if you want from 1,000 to 1,500, you could count by hundreds, count by 50s, count by 25s, whatever sounds good to you guys, okay? So make a nice box plot in your calculator and then see if you can copy it down and then describe the distribution of your SAT scores. Now, we will talk about this in class, but trying to get the shape of a distribution based on a box plot can be kind of tricky. So I'm going to see how well you guys can figure out the shape on your own, uh, and then we'll definitely discuss that first thing in class tomorrow. And that is all for video seven, and that is the last video of chapter one, 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 one. So we'll see you in chapter two.